Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest instalment of Border 100 Histories and Reflections, a symposium brought to you by Loud County Library Service. I'm joined tonight by Dr. Peter Rigney, to talk, who's going to talk to us about the trade unions and partition. And Peter's very keen to emphasize that this will be and partition rather than of or the partition of the trade unions. Peter has bent a lifetime uh, of service to the trade union movement. I think it's fair to say he worked for ICTU for many years. He is also currently involved with the Irish Railway Record Society and co-edits the Journal of the Irish Labour History Society, Sayher. Peter. Okay, uh, thank you for, for turning up tonight. Um, I've expanded the definition of the, of the talk that was given to me um, to cover two different types of partition. We all in our island assume that partition was on this island. There was also a partition of the United Kingdom. And I think Brian Hanley of Trinity has recently said that the United Kingdom lost more territory in World War I than Imperial Germany did. So while there was relatively little effect of partition on the trade union movement during collective bargaining, and in fact, some of the effects were entirely counterintuitive, there was a lot of effects um, on the labor movement and on collective bargaining in general. So for example, if we take the first year of the decade of centenaries, uh, 1913 to 2013, in which I was involved because Congress put a lot of time and effort and money into that centenary. The high point of, of that dispute was the appeal by Larkin to the British Trade Union Congress. In other words, the Dublin dispute was very much a dispute of the United Kingdom. That would have been impossible uh, in 1923, such had, such had been the change. Uh, there is one spoiler alert, however. In 1923, there was a dock strike, uh, a national dock strike, and the various port employers were called to the Department of Industry and Commerce in Dublin to attempt to effect a settlement. And including um, in the port employers in the Sarestad turning up in Dublin were, were the Newry port employers, which probably tells you more about the expectation in Newry as to what the Boundary Commission would deliver uh, than about industrial relations in, in, in the area. Now, I'm also going to talk about industrial relations because strikes give an awful lot of copy to journalists and an awful lot of copy to historians. But they are, not, they are not the meat and drink of trade unions. The meat and drink of trade unions is collective bargaining and day-to-day -day conditions. And strikes, while they occur in waves, occur relatively infrequently. The union structure, uh, say in 1913, you had three different types. One, you had national unions, and by that I mean national UK unions, all of which would have um, organised extensively in Ireland, such as National Union of Railwomen, Amalgamated Society of Engineers, Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers, and then civil civil and public services unions, such as the postal workers or letter carriers, as, as they were then. Now, the public service unions would have had an orderly and very civilised divide uh, after partition, uh, with the British unions remaining in the north and Irish unions being set up in the Republic. The other type of unions then were Irish national unions, which were mainly newer. You had the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, founded in in 1909, the Drapers Assistance Association founded a couple of years earlier, and the Irish National Teachers Organization. And then you would have had a variety of local, mainly craft unions, such as the Cork Offer of Butchers, uh, the Dublin Painters, the Belfast Flax Dressers, the Limerick Slaters and Tylers. So that was, they were the, um, they were the trade union structures. As far as the coordinating structures, the main ones were not Congress, as we know now, but were trades councils who exercised a much stronger role than they do now. So you would have had strong councils in Belfast, in Dublin, in Cork, and indeed in Dundalk. Um, and these would have exercised a coordinating role. Um, the Congress had since 1912, the Irish Trade Union Congress and Labour Party. Um, it existed without any full-time help. Its secretary was a voluntary part-timer, and um, it, it, its life revolved around the Congress and representations being made. The employer bodies, again, if we look at the, the employer structures, they were intensely local. There was the Dublin Employers' Federation, there was the Cork Employers' Federation, and there was tra uh, Chambers of Commerce. Um, so... There was 
uh, most bargaining was local. So, for example, the Drapers Assistance Association would negotiate with the employers in a particular town as to what day would be the half holiday. The craft unions would have a district rate, which would vary. So, for example, for fitters, there would be a different rate in Dundalk than in Belfast or in Dublin. And there would be a different rate between, say, fitters and boiler makers and carpenters in Dundalk. So it was all very local. And in 1913, as far as I can make out, there was no national, no national bargaining, with the exception of the bargaining that took place in the public service. So there was very little to partition. Uh, and of course, in any dispute, it's who, who was the ref? Well, the referee was the Board of Trade, pre-1921. Uh, and the Board of Trade and the Ministry of Munitions got a lot of increased power during the war under wartime emergency legislation um, to enforce uh, the settlement of disputes and to enforce de facto union recognition on employers. And this split in 1922 and the duties involved to the Ministry of Commerce, uh, Northern Ireland, and the Department of Industry and Commerce in the Free State. So th that's a basic picture of what, what happened in, in, uh, in 1913. But other things were happening. Um, the wartime saw a development of, of, of collective bargaining. And there was also in Britain a restructuring of unions where a lot of small societies came together uh, to form bigger unions. So, for example, the National Union of Railwaymen was founded in 1913 from three con con constituent parts. The Fitters Union, the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, had a big amalgamation in, in 1920 to become the Amalgamated Engineering Union. And in a, a separate uh, development, Irish Labour, through trades councils, attempted to launch itself politically in the period of 1918 to, to 1922. Now, again, from the, the Labour Party point of view, the big thing that stands out is the decision to stand uh, by in the, in, the, in the 1918 election to allow Sinn Féin a clear run. Um, and that, that has, has had some effects. But what is less remarked on is the huge successes of Labour candidates in the local elections of, of 1920. And Ireland wasn't immune from international developments. Um, at the end of the First World War, there was an international movement towards an HR day. Uh, it began in America. In France, they talks about Les Trois Huit. Um, and one of the things that, one of the reasons for this was to give returning soldiers a peace dividend, because it was a fear there would be widespread social discontent. So the HR day came in, that was seen as a big win, and union membership increased and increased radically. In terms of the national struggle, the transport union leadership and the Congress leadership in Dublin were very close to the, if you like, the doll and the counter state. These influ in, were influenced by both personal and ideological affinities. Transport union leaders such as Thomas Ford and William O'Brien <coughs> were interned in Frongock after 1916 and built relationships. Um, Tyg Barry was a transport union official in Cork and was interned in Ballykindler County Down, where he was shot by a sentry in 21. Another Cork uh, IRA commander, Sean Moylan, uh, came to Dublin on the run. He was a carpenter um, and he went to meet Thomas Ford of the transport union, who gave him two things. One, the addresses of the carpenters union, the Amalgamated Society of Woodworkers, and secondly, and very characteristically for Thomas Ford, a tip for an upcoming horse in Leopardstown. Um, similarly, Eamon Price, secretary of the local government officials union, now part of FORSA, uh, handed in his notice to the union in July 1920. Um, he said to the executive he wanted to better himself. In fact, he was taking up a position as IRA director of organisation. What has only become apparent since the um, release of the military service pension collection is the role of a shadowy body known as the Labour Board. And in 1919, the Supreme Council of the IRB in Dublin established a body known as the Labour Board. And its power, according to the people who made MSP pension statements, its mandate was to break the power of the British unions in Ireland and particularly in Dublin. Um, now, this process had already begun because in 1917, an Irish barman's union, 
Irish National Union of Vintners, Grocers and Allied Trades Assistant, now part of Mandate Union, was established. And it's possibly no coincidence that the president of that union was Paddy Moran, who was uh, executed after Bloody Sunday in 1920 for his involvement, alleged involvement in the shooting of British officers. The, the main achievement of the Labour Board was the establishment of the Irish Engineering, Foundry and Shipbuilding Trade Union, which was established with a grant of a thousand pounds uh, from the Dáil Department of Labour to break away from the Amalgamated Engineering Union, which they did, and some of the other British unions. And this also ensured that some of the smaller metalworking unions in Dublin, who would normally have been drawn into British amalgamations, were drawn into the new union. This is now part of Connect, and the Connect Trade Union will be launching a, which was formerly known as the TWU, uh, the Fitters and Electricians Union, will be launching an official history in the early part of, the, of, of next year, which will be available. So this was based on mainly the dissatisfaction by Irish membership of the reactions of British-based executives to things that were happening in Ireland. Now, this was not all one-way traffic, because similarly in 1919, four Ulster branches of the Irish National Teachers Organization, from memory they were Newtonards, uh, Lisburn, Enniskillen and Londonderry, banded together to found the Ulster Teachers Union. And it, this was to represent teachers in six county Ulster, as far as I can make out. I've never worked out uh, in 1919 did the Ulster Teachers Union recruit in the three lost counties of, of uh, Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. So there, there was a, a change in union structure, a number of amalgamations, a number of breakaways. In general, with some exceptions, these breakaways were messy. In the public service, there was a clear mandate for an orderly transition because the employer changed. Um, in some cases, such as the Vintners Union or the British National Union of Clerks, there was an orderly withdrawal from the Republic. This, uh, the British Electrical Trade Union similar, similarly withdrew. Now, there was a number of um, strikes, national strikes, in the south and west in support of the, um, the, the, the national struggle. The most obvious one is the munition strike, which I've dealt with in my last talk. The first one was, in fact, the anti-conscription strike of April the 23rd, 1918, which was a national shutdown. Um, in early 1920, there was a dispute over, uh, there was a two-day strike over hunger, hunger strikers. And again, um, the British government capitulated. And in 1922, the least successful of national strikes, and it showed in a way how the influence of, of Labour was marginalised, there was a national strike against militarism, if you like the Labour movement calling a plague on both your houses on the emerging civil war. From a border point of view, um, the events in Belfast always played a, a role. And in July 1920, there was, an, there was a sustained attacks on Catholics in Belfast and also on what were termed rotten prods, in other words, Protestants with uh, socialist or trade union views, who numbered an, uh, about 20 Orange Lodge members in their number who were driven out from their workplaces. Now, in the, in the Great Northern Railway, they could accommodate uh, some of them, they could park them, if you like, in Dundalk Works. But it's interesting that when people turned up in Dundalk say, time serve craftsmen, they were told um, that we're sorry, but your, your tenure here is only temporary because there's an agreement in place that all trade vacancies in Dundalk are reserved for people coming out of their time in Dundalk. So when people are, are faced with major civil unrest, being driven out of their workplace and heading south to be among their co-religionists, for want of a better word, they're told, yeah, yeah, we'll take you for a while, but, you know, don't, uh, don't be getting used to the place. You'll be going back to where you were. Also, in relation to uh, the Belfast expulsions, the British unions were shocked at their powerlessness uh, to try and affect uh, the, the, um, the expulsions from the shipyards. The British Amalgamated Society of Workshop Woodworkers um, expelled their entire Belfast membership because of their failure to reassimilate people who had been expelled from the shipyards. 
The other um, the other thing, the, the Labour influence, it's the British Labour Party Commission on Ireland, which took place in November 1920, just as things were getting bad. And there's a lovely little uh, vignette in the Journal of Aslev, the train driver's journal, where the General Secretary uh, gave a report of his visit to Ireland. And he said, he said, I saw in Cork what I thought I should never see, a man wearing his majesty's uniform, waving a weapon who was obviously under the influence of drink. So one of the things that undermined, if you like, the legitimacy of the British campaign in Ireland was the, the British Labour Commission in Ireland. And at least two British unions, ASLEF and the Electrical Trade Union, uh, balloted their members in Britain over industrial action in, in support um, or against government policy in Ireland. And in both, in, both, in both cases, they failed. Now, the wartime boom collapsed in late 1920 and British employers launched a, a counterattack. Now, this counterattack was delayed in Ireland uh, for very good reason. Like, for example, as I mentioned in my previous talk, um, in July 1920, the chairman of the Dublin Southeastern Railway, Frank Brook, uh, was sitting at his desk in Westland Row, now Pier Station, when the squad came in and shot him. Now, that was over a political dispute over the munition strike. But in that sort of a circumstance, uh, employers would be slow to, to press for a, a militant policy. So the employers' counterattack in Ireland uh, came much later. And in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, it didn't come until 22, 23. And the, the, the signature disputes in the 22, 23 period um, are the Waterford Farm Labourers dispute, which was comprehensively defeated with the assistance of the Special Infantry Brigade of the Free State Army, and the, uh, the National Dockers dispute. Interestingly enough, in a loud connection, the, in the National Dockers dispute, what were known as the railway ports stayed open. So this would have been Rosslair, part of the North Keys in Waterford, Dunleary, part of the North Wall, and of course Greenore. And if you look at the, tra the, the cattle export statistics through, through Greenore for 1922 versus 1923, you see a huge increase. So, the, the, situ the, the situation of partition made, um, made had virtually uh, no effect on the way trade unions carried out their business, or employers, because there was little or no national bargaining. Um, the Congress of Trade Unions, the only and, and again, the, the annual reports of the Congress of Trade Unions from, I think, about 1910 to 1924 are in the Decade of Centenary's website in the National Archives. And there are verbatim transcripts of the procedure, proceedings. And there's, there's very little um, mention of partition, uh, with the exception of the formation of a Belfast Labour Party. But there are two counterintuitive things that happen in this period. And they, they concern large national employers uh, who hold their finger on the pulse of the national economy and who had traditionally refused to recognise unions. They're the banks and the railways. And what I want to do for the remainder of my talk is to briefly describe how in this situation uh, collective bargaining evolved over this period. The there was a period of huge wage inflation between 1914 and 1919, and most manual workers through their unions got significant increases. Later on in the war, uh, from about 1917 on, clerks in particular, what are called the white-coated workers, didn't get such increases. And from about 1917, bank officials decided to set up an association. Uh, such was their fear of setting up an association uh, that at the founding meeting in Dublin, no bank official could be got to chair it. And a, a flurry, a, a storm arose at the meeting. But they got an outside chairman and was found out that this outside chairman was a relative of a bank official, but a trade union official. This caused a furore because they said, we are not a union. We don't get involved in that sort of stuff. We want a conciliatory, peaceful approach. And they took that conciliatory, peaceful approach for about two years and it got them precisely nowhere. 
they employed as an organising secretary a uh, senior counsel who went along to bank shareholders meeting having invested a pound in the shares of each of the banks and generally made a nuisance of himself and achieved nothing. And having achieved nothing and having said we, don't, we are not a trade union and we don't engage in these vulgar tactics, in late 1919 they decided that enough was enough and they issued strike notice that say if you don't recognise us and set up uh, an arbitrate on our claim, there will be a national bank strike from the 31st of December 1919. Um, that was followed up by a threat of dismissal of individual clerks. And they'd obviously done their homework because they had, over the, the previous six months, gone to poor law guardians and county councils throughout the country and said the bank clerks have a reasonable case and the bank should talk to them. But when the banks threatened to dismiss clerks, they said they had access to a capital of £100,000, they had a shell company, and that they would establish their own bank, and that they would, they would prioritise the establishment of bank branches in towns where bank clerks had been dismissed. Now, it was a, a high-wire act because the, it was, they were very un, newly unionised workers. Uh, they saw themselves as respectable pillars of society, and at the end of the day, it was uncertain as to about how many of them would actually go on strike. But the banks caved in went to arbitration and the union got a substantial amount of what they wanted. Incidentally, they didn't get until 1940 the condition that a bank official had to get permission to marry removed from the service contract. But anyway, by 1919, 1920, a national forum for all banks throughout the island of Ireland was established uh, and that lasted at least until the 60s and 70s. I'm not sure as to whether North and South diverged in the negotiations between the Irish bank officials and the associated banks. But, but the Irish Bank Officials Association, or the Financial Services Union as it's now known, is one of the, the few Dublin-based unions to maintain a branch in Northern Ireland. Uh, the others being the Irish uh, SIPTU, to the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, uh, and the Irish National Teachers Organisation. So there you have it's coterminous with partition, but it's the opposite of partition. You have a new form of industrial relations, which is a national agreement, and you have a national forum. And the banks, if you like, they were pragmatic. They, if you like, copped on early. They said, look, are we willing to take a chance of a strike? Are we willing to take a chance of a disruption? Or will we deal with these people who are, in fact, our staff? Now, another uh, group of employers the railways took a precisely opposite view. They said, and had said since 1890, we will not deal with trade unions. And it was an article of faith with the railways. But it, they were not a monolithic grouping. I mentioned Frank Brook, who was shot by the IRA. Frank Brook was on the pragmatic wing of the Railway Companies Association, along with the Midland Railway and the Cork Banton and South Coast. He said, guys, we're under government wartime control. We can either do a deal with the unions and shape the future on our terms, or we can wait until the government impose something on us. And they were forced into a minority by the more the dominant faction, which was the Great Northern Railway, number one, and the biggest railway, the Great Southern and Western Railway, whose chairman was Sir William Goulding, whose brother was a Conservative MP, and who said famously, uh, strange it may seem for the... the a luminary of the Southern Unionist Alliance, we will not hand over, we will not deal with unions which are based in England. So you have a member of the, of the Southern Unionist Alliance saying, we will not deal with English-based unions. Just at the same time, uh, and I should have mentioned this earlier, when the chairman of Mallow Urban District Council, a Sinn Féin uh, candidate, also the local chairman of ASLEF, um, was engaging in industrial action to try and ensure the maintenance of wages and conditions with Britain. Because in February 1919, the f lack of pragmatism of the Irish companies came home to roost. A set of conditions came about for the railways called the 8-hour day, standardisation of conditions, standardisation of wages. That was negotiated in Great Britain. And the words and Ireland were added uh, at the end of the agreement, allegedly by J. H. Thomas, the general the General Secretary of the NUR, who was an MP and a Privy Councillor. And Irish Railways had been brought under control in 1916 under government control and were to be handed back to their shareholders 
1921. And the railway company said, look, there were conditions conceded by the government in the period of control, which we are not observing. We're going back to a 10 hour day. And there was a permanent industrial relations crisis for about a year from August 21 to August 22. The details of it are like a lot of the details of industrial relations, intensely boring, and I won't go into it. However, in December 21, January 22, there were key talks between Countess Markovics, the, uh, the Minister for Labour, and the NUR in Dublin. Then, of course, came the treaty debates, and Countess Markovics resigned. And according to the file of the Great Northern Railway, there is no Minister for Labour. So the NU war were a bit dazed and then suddenly remembered there's another government and another minister for labour 100 miles up the road. So they decamped up to Belfast and spoke to J.M. Andrews, who was the Northern Ireland Minister for Industry and Commerce and also a director of the Belfast and County Down Railway. So that crisis occurred in the spring of 22. And in the Collins Craig proposals of March 22, there are five key points to be dealt with. And one of them was to resolve the railway problem. And while North-South relations got worse throughout 1922, the civil servants on both sides, who probably had been colleague, well, had been colleagues in the old Board of Trade, worked together under the radar to found a body known as the Irish Railway Wages Board. This body was to be constituted as follows. I court judge as chairman, and the person who was chairman was Wiley, who was of 1916 court martial's fame. There was one rep from the Belfast Chamber of Commerce, one rep from the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, two reps from the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress, one North and one South, and then a negotiating committee composed of the unions and a negotiating committee composed of the companies. Now, that was coming into effect in 1923, and the, the last holdout was the largest company, the Great Southern and Western. So the Belfast and County Down Railway, whose board member J.M. Andrews, as I said, was Northern Ireland Ministry of Labour, wrote to the Great Southern and Western Railway and said, look, well, to put it in contemporary language, they said, look, this is the last chance saloon. You better join up or else. And they joined up. And then, like when most committees are set up, there was a, a, a debate on who gets to go on the committee. And obviously the bigger companies all got their seat and there was a seat for the smaller companies. And there was a debate as to whether it should be the Dublin Southeastern or the Belfast and County Down Railway. And one of the other companies said, the Belfast and County Down, County Down Railway has the obvious call on the seat because were it not for the efforts of the Northern government, this body would not have been brought into effect. So there you go. If you look at partition as a twin partition, as an east-west and a north-south uh, affair, the, uh, the period 1913 to 23 saw huge changes. As I said, 1913 was a Dublin dispute fought out in a UK context. That would have been impossible in 1923. The IRB, through its infiltration of unions through the Labour Board, managed to reshape significant parts of the Irish trade union movement. But most bargaining remained local. And in, but, however, in two national industries, the opposite of partition happened in the period 19 to 19 to 1923 is that national all island structures were established, which lasted for, in the case of the bank officials of the 60s and in the case of the railways up to 1945 when the, um, the Labour Court was established. So I'm sorry if I've managed to, to produce very little on the North South partition because it wasn't there, but I hope I have uh, kept, uh, I, I hope I haven't bored you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I think that went, uh, that was really interesting insight into the how things laid out in the period. I am uh, reminded that the history of the IBOA is was called uh, Handling Change. So I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's the way, I think that's something that maybe comes across in your talk that the you have a movement here, which is, I think it's fair to say the trade union movement is, is very much a growing movement in this period, isn't it? Yeah, fair, fairly rapidly growing, though it, it, when the employer's counterattack comes in 23, it, 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 the tide goes out for a period of time. 
And for example, in the Irish Railway Wages Board, of which I've seen the proceedings, between 1923 and 1938, it never discussed anything except the scale of wage cuts. So uh, the board would come in and the railway companies would say, we want a 10% wage cut, and there'd be uh, a lot of negotiation and sidebars. And they might come out and say, well, there's a 3.5% wage cut, and that would be that would be a great victory. However, the thing about the 20s and 30s was it was a period of great deflation. So, you know, if, if, if the deflation was um, more significant than the wage cut, your property living standards are, are keeping it, are, you know, at least keeping pace. Okay, yeah, really interesting. Um, what do you think of the ITGWU history by, uh, I think it's by Graves, is that by Greaves rather than Graves? Desmond Greaves, yeah. Um, I remember as a student being in Liberty Hall when he was going through the the basement of of, of Liberty Hall. Uh, well, I mean, he he writes he writes extremely well, but he would. I mean, Desmond Greaves was was uh, you know a faithful follower of King Street of the Communist Party of Great Britain, and if the Communist Party of Great Britain had to change their line in the morning, he would have changed it. You know, like like Desmond Greaves would have been a, a, a person who in 1940 uh, was totally against the concept of imperialist war and would have espoused what they called um, constructive defeatism. And then all of a sudden on the 7th of June 1941, he was all, all in favour of the the people's struggle against Nazi oppression. So, but that being said, he writes well. He does, yeah. And his, 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 other, what's he, his other book on Liam Mellows as well is quite useful, I think. Um, how did the uh, ATGWU um, survive away from the T&G? Well, so no, the, <clears throat> the ATGW branches in Drogheda and Dock were the old National Union of Dock Labourers. And they just stayed the way they are. Whereas in the north, in Newry, the Dock Labourers branches went to the Irish Transport Union. So th this is what I meant about the uneven, the uneven shattering. Then in the 20s, um, as part of, of inter-union rivalry, the Transport and General Workers Union was founded by Ernest Bevan in, I think, 1922. And as part of a continuing war between Irish and British unions, the Irish Transport Union took a high court action under something to do with intellectual property, saying, we own the name Transport and General Workers Union and you can't use it. So the at and G is was only the at and G in Ireland, and it's the Transport General Workers Union in Great Britain. It was the amalgamate of transport in Northern Ireland. This is a thing to bear in mind, by the way, that there are two, three different labour labour law systems. There is Great Britain labour law, there is Irish labour law, and there is Northern Ireland labour law, which is different. So, for example, in some of the Thatcher anti-trade union legislation. Was was never fully transposed into northern into Northern Ireland law. Now, you will find, however, and I mean, they talk about a united movement in in the nineteen forties. The a lot of the unions solely based in the Republic uh, moved away and formed the Congress of Irish Unions, uh, and wanted, if you like, to to a clean break. They they wanted basically to to drive the British unions out of the Republic, uh, regardless of what their members thought. Uh, and one person in, in, I think, in the 1940s who was uh, a delegate for one of the craft unions in Cork said, this job should really be done in 1921, which is kind of kind of scary. Uh, now, I can't remember who said that. I remember reading it somewhere, but this is a great thing about lectures. You don't have to footnote. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but that's interesting, that the, the, the break between the three and the, the local... The local bargaining is there much um how does the the labor movement react and how, what is the interplay like with some of the the belfast labor unionist candidates in the in the in the north what is the relationship between them and the ilp tuc and you know is there is there a relationship or is there is there just a complete rupture in northern ireland would have become part of great britain agreements that would have established from the from the 1920s onwards. Shipbuilding in Belfast followed the, the Clyde raids. And up to the 60s, it was always said to me, and I would go to Belfast occasionally, but that as important in Belfast 
was the, the British Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions. They were they were the really important players. Congress itself didn't set up a Northern Ireland Committee until 1945, and that was not recognised by the Northern Government until 1962. And the the recognition of the Northern Ireland Committee, of the Irish Council of Trade Unions, was achieved after a, a bit of intermediary work by the uh, the the Council, Irish Council of Churches and also coincided with the end of the IRA Operation Harvest campaign. That, that could be coincidental, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and did the British British Labour movement have much, much to say on that, or did they? No. Was this a territorial thing? British, um, um, British trade unions sometimes get a bit confused by, by Northern. They, you know, you see officials coming across here, maybe for inter-union disputes, and I'm talking about my own time, um, and they're a bit perplexed by the the, di the different system we have. You know, we say, well, we don't do that here, or this is how we do things here. And this would apply in Northern Ireland. I'm not talking about the Republic. Yeah. Um, getting back to the, maybe the 20s, to what extent do you think there's, I mean, there's always been a narrative, which I'm sure you're aware of, and which you'll, you know, we might as well take the chance to, to, co to hear your comments on, of of how partition harmed the labor movement now you've talked there about the the employers kind of counter-attack in 1923 yeah. to what i mean what's your view on 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 that whole um narrative i suppose i put it um well i mean traditionally it would have it would have um the division of of ireland would have uh detached the the greatest industrialized part from the rest of Ireland. But I mean, what were the alternatives? I mean, the alternatives might might well have been a civil war. I don't I don't like getting involved in this stuff because it's, you know, it's like a monopoly board game, you know. You throw a three and there's four counties detached, or you throw a seven and the partition didn't happen. It's yeah. it's it's kind of useless, you know? Um yeah, I mean I think I, I um I mean that's the thing about the counterfactuals. If you're gonna go if one thing's gonna change you have to work out how many other things would have changed as well. And uh, somebody said, uh, somebody said that a couple of the WI general secretaries were in the British Army. Uh, in contrast to the uh, Irish Transport Union, well, the, I mean, people in, in the leadership of the Irish Transport Union would not have been in the British Army. Indeed, Mickey Mullen, the former general secretary, was in the IRA. Um, but I know a couple of transport union officials, both acting, both former and indeed current SIP2 officials, who served in the British Army, and it's purely an accident that they, you know, they didn't come to the the, the you know come come to leadership positions but there the um a number of a number of 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 ex-army people have been have been involved because effectively the skills of union organizing and the skills of influencing men are effectively the skills that a good nco should have okay yeah that's it's my belief evidently that armies are run by ncos and their prime role is to protect the men from the officer class <laughs> Very good. Um, and when when we're looking at um, when we're looking at the the unions in this period, do they do they feel do do people just break down? Is there how much of a of a perspective is there that is there any perspective on partition that that you would discern that is different from a wider wider society? I mean, I mean, obviously we have the exception here, whereby we see all sorts of things rupturing. Obviously, the churches don't rupture, and we have, um, you know, thirty-two county um, wage wage boards and industrial bargaining. But is there any different perspective brought on partition in this point that that you see in the in the labour in within the trade union movement, or is it just more just a reflection of, of what's going on in wider society? Well, I, I think, with the exception of the industries that I've outlined and the public service bargaining is local like the shop assistance union in Uri is going to determine whether wednesday or thursday is a half holiday and the shop assistance union in dundalk is going to so they're you know in a, in a system of widespread uh decentralized local bargaining partition doesn't really mean a great deal because the you know it, it was done on a town by town basis um and there's there's very little re and, and and then again from the 20s onward as national agreements become more more prominent in Britain, Northern Ireland gets drawn into those national agreements. Um, 
and and then Northern Ireland begins to draw up its its own its own labour laws. So it it there's a, there's a process of gradual divergence, except of course in the in the big industries I've outlined. Yeah. Yeah. And um, how how are the relations to other in general between the, the trade union movement in the south and Common and Wales? Does does the and then Fianna Fáil, does that is there a different different relationship? I mean, I know um JJ Walsh being bounced out of the government at one point in the twenties, does that um and he would have been something of a supporter of Labour. Does the does that affect relations and how are relations in general? With with whom? With Fianna Fáil? Yeah, with Common and Oil. Common and Oil relations would not have been good. Um, and indeed, um, with all the zeal of a convert, Joe McGrath, who was a former transport union official. Sorry, it was Joe McGrath, I was thinking. Sorry. Um, enthusiastically took on the job of breaking a strike on the Ardner Crusher scheme. And one of the things, if you look at the, um, the 1930s, one of the unique selling points of Fianna Fáil was that, look, we came to power, we have the, the Conditions of Employment Act, etc., etc., etc. We have unemployment benefit and you know, if you want to look after your, your position as a worker, um, you know, vote Fianna Fáil. And there would have been a very close relationship between the leadership of some of the unions and Fianna Fáil because, you know, there's nothing like being, doing a stretch in jail with someone to, to build a bond of comradeship. William O'Brien had been in Frangoch, Thomas Foran had been in Frangoch, uh, Donald O'Reilly, the plasterers union had been in Frangoch. And if I, if I rooted through my brain, I could, find, I could find out another few. And they were were most of these um, kind of collateral damage to the rising, or had they had they fought in the rising? Um, well, in fact, the rising would have decapitated some of the unions. Like you had uh, Padre Mac of the Painters Union, Richard O'Carroll of the um, of the Bricklayers were killed in the rising. Uh, William Partridge, who was a leader in the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, who had worked for the Transport Union, was died of of Bright's disease, which was contracted in jail. So, uh, but a lot of the people who were interned, like um, Ty Barry, William O'Brien, Thomas Foran, where collateral damage was just sweep them all up. You know, it's a Sinn Féin plot. Interesting enough, I'm reading a book on a um, new book on British Army recruitment in Ireland. The, the catch all term Sinn Féin as, as a, an abusive phrase originated not with the British press after 1916, but with the seemingly with the Irish Parliamentary Party to. Uh, to describe anti-recruitment or uh, anti-war activity from about 1914 onwards. So the term Sinn Féin rebellion just didn't, you know, ascend from heaven uh, in, in May 1916. It was around uh, as, as, as a term, as, as a pejorative term. Yeah, I think... Uh, the term anti-vaxxer didn't arrive with COVID. It was there before. Yeah. Yeah. It was like... Um... The, the I mean the Sinn Fein term I think it's it's worth noting that Augustine Burrell even uses it in his um, testimony to the um, inquiry into the rising and he more or less just describes it as um, extreme anti Englishness but he recognises that that's a, a, a part of part of um, part of I an ever I think it's an ever present of Irish life and politics I think is the term he uses you know hostility yeah. to the English connection. Um, but so, which is interesting in itself, and interesting in the, in the. I mean, you just said about the um, the the Labour Board in nineteen nineteen and the MSPC. Do you want to do you want to expand on that a bit? I mean, it's something I found researching the MSPC that you see a lot of. Um, it was there was two things that you'd see a lot of um, references to was the IRB men being sent to join certain unions, or, and the other one was obviously spying that was unverifiable. So, so do you want to maybe? Let us know how kind of views of that are changing at the moment in, in terms of well, history. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing to be written there in the Labour Board. There's about, I think, there's at most seven or eight people who are involved in the Labour Board. They're with a number, with one or two exceptions, they're all uh, mechanical crafts people uh, around the railways, around the Inchicore area. Um, they claim a lot of things. Um, some are successes, some were not. Um, one was a guy who was involved in the clerical workers union who was there to, if you like, I think he worked in the labor exchanges, but it, it, um, 
you know, it, it wasn't known. It's one of the, it's one of these nuggets that arose out of, out of the Labour Board. Um, now the Dáil Airden papers, which and they're 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 partially digitised in the National Archives, will show the the money trail into the um, into the foundation of the Irish Engineering Union. But also, when it was in the Galway conference in 2019, um, there was a woman whose name eludes me. The other thing that the Labour Board did is they ran an employment agency for domestic service and typists. So somebody in the castle who said, I need a cleaner, uh, they got someone who was a, an impeccable uh, widow woman, widow of a, of a, a widowed by, by the war, but whose daughter was in coming the mom who had the, the task of cleaning out the waste paper baskets of the, of the senior castle official. So, I mean, this, this is classic stuff. And it's, it's you know, at, at intelligence level, it's, it's, it's very good. But you, you also, you know, you get the extent, like there's one guy whom I know of, a guy called Thomas McGuire. He was in the stationary engine drivers union. Uh, because we pre in a crush it. Every factory had a boiler and was attended by a stationary engine driver. And, um, he mentions that he was sacked from his job in the railway as a locomotive fireman after 1916. He doesn't mention that he was secretary of the train drivers union as left up to that period, which is kind of important because he says he organised he organised people to carry weapons down the west end. You don't always get the full story in in MSPC um, applications. Now, before the MSPC came out, everyone said, "Look." There was, uh, you know, there's, there's money involved and people will tell packs of lies to get money. Whereas, in fact, we now know that the, you know, the giving out of pension was done in an extremely niggardly manner. But then you go, and I, I was just um, shaving myself yesterday morning, listening to Radio and a girl took that, and I picked up, uh, somebody was saying that um, his grandfather was involved in an attack on Spittle Barracks in 1920, and that there were eight people involved, but that the person who wrote up the thing for the MSBC uh, enumerated 22 people in order to give him a chance of a pension. You know, you, you, you just don't know. But the important thing is, and again, th this is in contrast to the Bureau of Military History, because the Bureau tends to, to, to take the top echelons. The MSPC is, is a cut right through the various ranks. Some are chancers, some not. Um, and, and, you know, there's, it's, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things I found with the uh, MSPC, or when, one of the places I came across the Labour Board was, I think they, they seem to be a lot of, um, ret uh, you know, retired, for want, want of a better term, 1916 veterans. So 1916 veterans who are no longer uh, fit for mount marching around mountains or, or rioting in the streets or things like that, whatever the volunteers are up to in, in 17 and 18 and 19. And mm. I think it seems to be that they seem to get ex Frongok and ex nineteen sixteen men to do to do this kind of work. Um, I think also it's interesting. One thing I found, um, one nugget I found in the uh, Civil War captured documents in the uh, military archives is that they have a lot of com. They have a lot of there's a there's com there's correspondence there from an, that's obviously captured. It's from an individual who works uh, on the one of the lines in the west who's saying that I'll help you as I've often helped before. So he's obviously they're trying to reactivate in the mid 1920s. They're trying to reactivate him as a courier on the line. Yeah, uh, well, this goes back to the, the Civil War. And what I would have said the last time is like the the anti-treaty forces in, I think, the 3rd of August demanded a very, uh, if you like, abruptly of railway women that, that, that they do uh, what they had done voluntarily during the munition strike and like we're Irish people you know often things if somebody demands you do something that you would previously have done voluntary you say no I'm not doing that so go away and that's 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 what happened yeah so it's, it's interesting change uh, I think um but I think, yeah, that's, I mean, I think there is a point there in the MSPC about, I think it's probably true both ways that, that, that people are, um, people are maybe exaggerating, but there also may be other, there may be other factors whereby it's something small. So, so somebody might be on a list for participating in, a, in an ambush where in fact, they actually, you know, all they did was chop down the trees outside the other, another village just to stop people going through. 
But the, the other thing to bear in mind about the MSBC, it, it shows the dangers of historians of over-reliance on one source. For example, the men, all 1916 men who were dismissed, and there were quite an amount, were restored to service in, I think, July 22, after negotiations between the railway companies and Joe McGrath. And you can see this in this one record card of a guy called Keenan in the dock, who's a clerk. And it just said, um, left the company service May 1916. They resumed duty July 1922. Now, if you go into, if you and that's one side of the transaction. The other side of the transaction, you go into MSP uh, claims and you said, yes, I lost my job after 1916. And I didn't get my job back until 1922 when Joe McGrath did a deal. And you can go through the board minutes of all the companies and you will not find the mention of a high level discussion with the Minister for Labour. So, you know, just because it's not in a board minute doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And that is the, the cautionary tale for, for, for historians. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you were going to, um, if you're going to sum up what were, what were the important facts of, of the, uh, the trade union movement in this period, the trade union movement's reaction, what, what would it be? <clears throat> well, I think what does Shu and Loy say about the French Revolution? It's too early to say. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I think um, one of the things that, uh, that puzzles people from continental trade union centres uh, and people from Great Britain uh, to say, well, actually, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions operates in two, member, in, in two countries. That really drives them mad, you know, they just cannot compute. Um, and two types of people dislike that. One were extreme Republicans um, in the 40s uh, who were represented by the phrase, we should have had this clean cut in 1922. And the other people in the Ulster Workers' Council strike around 1974 who would have had, uh, who would have wanted an Ulster TUC. So, you know, there is a, if you like, uh, I won't say ramshackle, but it's it, it can be a different, a different, a difficult coalition at times. Uh, that there is a, is a single labour movement, uh, but it, it's it's it is it has been to the the advantage of workers on both sides of the island that 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 it is, and indeed one of the things that the uh, I think the Scarman Tribunal found in 1969 was the role of shop stewards in the shipyard, calming things down and preventing Belfast in 1969 being a lot worse than it actually was. Okay. Uh, and, and that probably brings us to one final kind of point of discussion, which was the, the so-called rotten prods in the in the shipyards yeah. in the 20s. And is there, um, at what point, I mean, there's probably two questions I'd have to see just, do you know more about them? Do they, at what point are they, if, if you say, if the 1916 men are restored in 1922, are these... Are they ever taken back into the fold when the, when the, the threat passes? And secondly, do any of them ever move? To, I mean, we know nationalists, nationalists who are Catholics who are victimised often moved south. And you were, I think, you were even talking about it to, to some degree earlier. Um, was there any instances of um, Protestants who were victimised just saying, "Oh, to help it moving south"? Um, I would, I would have. I don't know. The honest answer is I don't know. But again, you've got to understand the nature of shipyard construction is that when an order was finished, a load of people got sacked. A new order came in, people were hired again. You know, shipyard work is, is by, by its very nature, episodic. Um, and the people who ran, a lot of the research that's been done, the people who ran the expulsions, were not the labour aristocrats, were not the tradesmen of the, of the, of the shipyards. They were generally apprentices and labourers. They, they, they were of a younger, a younger generation because people who had worked in the, in the shipyard, who had gone to war or gone to the Navy in World War I, would have been, in, in, in certain employments, they would have been guaranteed their jobs back. Say if you worked in the Great Northern Railway or the Sirocco Works, you would have got your job back. But getting your job back in the shipyard didn't mean a great deal mm -hmm. because you just got your job back to the end of the existing order and then you would have been turfed out on your ear. I think you have to understand 
the nature of the of the labour process. Now the the Harland and Wolf records are there, and I'm you know it's surprising how few people have actually made use of them, but they are there, and one or two scholars have gone have gone through through them. Okay, that's really inter interesting. And what did they? What would a dock worker typically do at this point? Or sorry, a ship a shipyard worker typically do at this point? In between orders, were they? Did they work at something else? I don't know. Well, you, you see, know. some of them have had transferable skills, like uh, carpenters would have been shipyard carpenters would have been among most highly skilled, because most house carpenters are dealing with square objects. Ships are curved objects, you know. Therefore, they are, you know, my late brother-in-law was a shipyard carpenter, and the level of his craftsmanship was incredible. Uh, electricians could move along, but stuff like riveters, platers, stagers who erected the scaffolding were pretty much tied to the to the yard in terms of the labour process and their skills. But as I say, boiler makers, uh, fitters, electricians, plumbers could move could move elsewhere. Okay, so there would, would have been a huge collapse in um, in shipyard orders after World War One because I think the Ger the Allies confiscated a sub substantial part of the German merchant marine. Yeah. You know. Yeah, the Germans had. It's interesting, yeah. Um, so I think um, we leave it there. Um, my dad's still talking to me because we got the obligatory uh, mention of his former um, lunch partner, Mickey Mullen, into the evening's discussion. Um, uh, so thanks very much, Peter. Uh, I think that was another great uh, talk, which gave us a real insight into enough into something that we hadn't. A lot of us wouldn't have known a lot about, and I think helped to uh, broaden the broaden the scope of the symposium in a really um, erudite and uh, authoritative way. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.